Hello, this is Jack Jackson. In this video, we're going to talk about how to use integrals to find surface area. So, for example, consider the surface defined by z equals x squared plus, uh, let's say, 2y squared. And let's do this for z running to 0 to 8. So roughly it looks something like this, this uh, surface here. How can we find the surface area? Well, earlier you may think we've done some surface areas, but this would be back maybe in Calculus 2, uh, possibly Calculus 1, where we, we did this as a surface area of revolution. But this is a little bit different. This is not quite a surface area of revolution. How can we do something like this? So the first thing I want to do in trying to develop a method for this is to consider the tangent plane. So let's take a particular point. Let's say when x is 2 and y is 1, if we plug that in there, we get 4 plus 2 times 1 is 6. So z should be 6. So 2, 1, 6 is this point right here on the surface. And we could look at the tangent plane there. So remember, the tangent plane is a good approximation to the surface, at least if you're close to that point of tangency. So uh, remember, to find the tangent plane, we need to find the partial of z partial derivative of z with respect to x, which is 2x, and the partial derivative of z with respect to y, which is 4y, and evaluate those when x is 2 and y is 1, so that gives us a 4 for both of those. And then the tangent plane is uh, the partial derivative of z with respect to x at the point, which is 4, times x minus the x-coordinate of 2, plus the partial derivative of z at y at that point, which is 4, times parentheses y minus the y-coordinate of 1, and then plus the z-coordinate of 6. Of course, obviously, if you plug in the point 2 and 1 for x, you do get 6 for z. So this is uh, that point A right there. The point 2, 1, 6 is on both the curve and the tangent plane, and that is your uh, tangent plane. Now let's look at just a little piece of that tangent plane, and let's zoom in a little closer and so we might have a little parallelogram slice of that tangent plane. Okay, and I'm going to take, uh, if we were to project this down into the xy plane, this point would be above the uh, point 2, 1. And then we would go over some delta x and some delta y for the opposite corner. And that would be 2 plus delta x and 1 plus delta y for some delta x and delta y, and then above that would be this point. Now this point up here is not on the, the, the surface itself. The only one on the surface is this point down here, but this is a tangent plane. So I'm going to zoom in on this, this uh, focus on this parallelogram for a minute, but I'm going to do it now, not necessarily for this specific function, but in general. So that little piece is this little parallelogram that you see shaded right here. Project it down in the xy plane, we have our AB is this corner here. Okay. And we can, uh, can go up and look at this little slice up here, which is a slice of the tangent plane. Okay. So think about this point AB0. Go out delta x this way the x direction, and this will give you the point a plus delta x, same b, still z of 0. Now when we go up from that, we're looking at, um, well, let's look go up from this one first. Here we have a, b, 0. We go up from that. This is the point a, b, f of a, b, uh, and that's our point of tangency, on the, uh, which is both on the tangent plane and on the surface itself. Now, what about this corner here? Well, we go up here, but notice we're not going up to the surface, so it's not just f of a plus delta x and f of b, and then uh, above for the for the or it's not just not just f of that x and y to get the z. It is the same x and y, uh, a plus delta x for x and b for for y, but the z is going to be this z here. Plus, well, we're only changing in the x direction, 
So that's the partial derivative with respect to x evaluated at that point times whatever we have for delta x. And that's going to be the, the delta z between these two points here. And so we add that to the, the f of a, b. And this will be. So it's f of a, b plus delta z. Delta z is delta x times f sub x evaluated at a, b. Notice we did not change in the y direction. Okay, similarly, we're going to go down this side over here. Going down this side, we leave uh, down here in the xy plane, we're going to leave a alone. Of course, z is still 0 because we're in the xy plane. But now the y coordinate is going to be the y coordinate here, b, plus whatever this delta y is. Now we're going to go up from there. Well, it's going to be the same a and same x and y, a for x and b plus delta y for b for, for y. But the z is going to be this z over here, f of a b plus delta z. But this the delta z again is not up to the surface, but it's up to the tangent plane. And so what we look at here, that's going to be um, f sub y of a b times delta y is the delta z on the tangent plane as we go across there. So we add that to the f of a, b, and that's our point there. So anyway, we have these, these uh, three points. And remember, this is a parallelogram. And of course, above this, this is going to be a, a above this uh, rectangle here in the xy plane will be a parallelogram on the tangent plane. We're going to call the area of this little parallelogram delta s. And of course, one way we can find area of a parallelogram is do the norm of the cross product of the two vectors defined by these things going on the sides. So what is this vector u here? Well, it's just delta x. a plus delta x minus a is just delta x, or it's the change in x for the change in x. The y's don't change at all, so that's just 0. Of course, that would be the, the b minus the b. And then we do the delta z for here, which is just f sub x times f sub x of a b times delta x. And similarly for v, uh, it's a vector where the, the delta x is 0, delta y is delta y. And delta z is f sub y of a b times delta y. So we're going to take these two vectors, we're going to cross product them, and then take the norm of that. And that'll give us the size of this delta s. OK, let's chase through the details of that. So we're finding the size of this delta s. There's our u and our v from the previous thing. And delta s then is the norm of that cross product. So that's the norm of the determinant i, j, k vectors, the vector uh, delta x, 0, f sub x, uh, delta x here. And the last row is 0, delta y, f sub y, delta y. Okay, of course, expanding by minors, that's the norm of the vector here is, is uh, for i, you use this minor of these two, these, these four cells, minus the minor for j is these two and these two here, and for k, you use these four here, and we do determinants there. So 0 times this is 0 minus the, determ the product this way, so the first term is minus f sub x times delta x delta y. Now for the middle, we've got minus this way and plus this way because of the minus here. So we get minus f sub y delta x delta y there and 0 this way. And here we get delta x delta y minus 0 is delta x delta y. Now we have our cross product vector. Now we want to find the norm of that cross product vector. Okay, the way to do that is the square root of the square, sum of the squares of each part. So square this part, square that part, square that part, add the three things, then square root. So the first component is the opposite of f sub x times delta x delta y. We want to square that plus the second component, the opposite of f sub y times delta x delta y. Square that plus the last one, delta x delta y squared. Notice they all have a delta x delta y square as a factor, so I can factor that out. And then the square root of the delta x delta y squared is just delta x delta y, which comes out of the square root there. 
What does that leave inside? Well, we can drop the minuses because squaring a negative just makes it positive anyway. So this is f sub x squared plus f sub y squared plus 1, all that under a square root, and then times delta x delta y. Now, remember what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be approximating the, the surface area that we're looking for with a bunch of these little tangent plane pieces. Now, we're going to basically take the domain, break it into little rectangular pieces. Say, take the lower left corner of each one of those pieces, go up to the curve, to the surface, I should say, make this little tangent plane parallelogram, find that area. That's the delta S sub K. Okay? And you do this for, for K going 1 to, say, some N, however many, however many of these little rectangles we have. And then we sum those up. That would be an approximation of the surface area we're looking for. Now, we take a limit of that as what? As the number of those little rectangles down here goes to infinity, and the sizes of the delta A's down here, or the delta S's up here, go to uh, zero, and now we, have deter we, we, we get an integral. And so the integral we end up with is S is the double integral over the domain ds, where ds is given by this here. So it's basically what happens when we take our uh, expression right here and we, we take the limit, the, the delta s becomes ds, the delta x and the delta y become dx and dy. Of course, dx times dy, another way to say that's da. So here's one way to write that. So that you double integral over the domain, uh, f sub x squared plus f sub y squared plus 1 square root, and then integrate that uh, with respect to the a, da, so a double integral. Okay, let's see if we can put this uh, to work in our example. Okay, so we're going to approximate the area uh, the area of the surface de defined by z equals x squared plus 2y squared for z going from 0 to 8. That was our, our original problem. The domain is actually, well, it turns out to be this ellipse. So the biggest, uh, to get all of the x, y coordinates that are actually used here, it's above whatever happens at the top here because this thing's getting wi wider as it goes up. So the widest spot is at the top where z equals 8. And so if you put 8 equals x squared plus 2y squared, that is an ellipse. Okay? If we solve this, we need to solve this for y or x. It's actually easier to solve for x. So if we solve for x, x squared is uh, 8 minus 2y squared. So in the first quadrant at least, or actually in the first and the fourth quadrants, um, x is the positive square root of 8 minus 2y squared. So if we just look at this, because of the symmetry of the curve and the symmetry in the domain and everything, if we will just figure out the, the uh, surface area above this first quadrant piece of this ellipse and then multiply by 4, that will give us the surface area that we're looking for. So I'm going to do it that way. Okay, so we just plug everything in here. So the double, the dA is dx first, then dy, because we want to integrate with respect to x first. And notice on this first quadrant, x is going to run from 0 up to this curve, which is given by that formula. So those are my limits on x. And then y is going to run from 0 to 2. So this is better to solve for x than y in this case for two reasons. Number one, it was slightly easier to solve for x up here in the formula. And number two, uh, we have some really nice numbers, 0 and 2, for the uh, boundaries here, nice integers, where it's some uh, square root of something here out for the, uh, for the x limits. So it kind of just kind of works a little bit nicer in setting it up if we solve it for x rather than solving for y. We could have done it the other way. It would have turned out to be the same thing. 
All right, so there we have our limits. It's going to be four times that because we just found one quadrant, and then four times that will give you the whole surface area. Now here, our arc length, or no, not arc length. It's similar to the arc length differential, but it's our surface area differential. It's going to have a um, partial derivative with respect to x. So we look back up here, uh, we can see that that's going to be 2x. That goes here. And look at your f of x or z here in the original function. And the partial derivative with respect to y is 4y. So that goes in here. There's always a 1 there. And at this point, I'm going to plug it into a calculator. I plugged it into my TI Inspire CAS, and it did not come up with an exact answer. Like the um, arc length problems, these integrals are typically pretty nasty to find antiderivatives for, maybe even impossible. And so we typically will only get decimal approximations for these, but Simpson's rule worked pretty nicely. You can essentially set this up the same way as this, and your uh, even a TI-84 calculator, I think, will will work out and do this pretty. Uh, will do this nested uh, integrals okay. So anyway, that's the surface area, or at least approximately. It's about 83.87. So now we can see how to do surface area. Before we go, let me. Um, just sh show you some different integrals here and show you how there's some interpretations here that are, are similar. If we want to find just length on the x-axis, we're integrating from a to b dx. That's just going to give us a, a, a delta x, basically. Okay, it's just, uh, well, it's just b minus a, which is the length of that interval. Okay, but if we integrate f prime of x squared plus 1 square root, then that's going to give us an arc length in the xy plane. So that was our arc length parameter. I think we maybe wrote this as dy over dx here. Okay, And the a and b are x1 and x2. And the area in the xy plane is just the integral of dA, a double integral over the domain. That will give you the a, the area. And the surface area is it's something similar to that arc length thing, right? It's it's the um, partial derivative with respect to x squared plus the partial derivative with respect to y squared of our function f or z, and then plus 1, and then you have dA out here. And of course, we may set this up as being dA as being dx dy or dy dx, or we could even convert to, uh, we may even have it set up in some other coordinates. But this is the, the basic interpretation here. And hopefully you can see that that's, uh, there's some similarities there that can uh, help you with that.